Good evening, everyone, wherever you are in the world. Uh, you're all very welcome to this, the last uh, in this series of Fireside Conversations hosted by the McGee campus of Ulster University on the theme Heritage, Healing and Home, which is part of the American Conference for Area Studies 2021. Uh, my name is Joe Mahan. I make television programs for a living, but I have to confess that I'm much happier halfway up a mountainside or standing on a riverbank because most of my programs are about the rural heritage of Ireland. Uh, but it's my privilege tonight to chair the proceedings uh, uh, which follow and to introduce you to the very distinguished panel of speakers that we have here. Two of them physically in the studio uh, beside the fireside with me and the other two joining us via the miracle of modern technology from the comfort of their own home. So let me as briefly as possible introduce uh, our virtual guest first. Bernadette McCallisky requires no introduction really to anyone who knows anything about the history of Ireland in the latter half of the 20th century. She is a lifelong human rights and social justice campaigner whose activities have ranged from neighbourhood organising through to national protest movements and parliamentary representation. She currently coordinates the activities of STEP, which is the South Tyrone Empowerment Programme established in 1997. STEP is a rights-based community development organisation based in Dungannon, County Tyrone, that in 2001 rose to the challenge of equitable integration of new migrant workers into the local community. Welcome, Bernadette. Linda Irvine is a language rights activist from East Belfast. She is a speaker of and a supporter of the Irish language and is the project leader of the Tourist Irish Language Project, which aims to connect people from Protestant communities to their own history with the Irish language. Tourist is operated through the East Belfast mission of the Methodist Church in Ireland. Linda has gained considerable media attention because of the fact that she comes from a Protestant unionist background and supports the Irish Language Act, a position generally regarded as unconventional. You're very welcome, Linda. Thank you. Paul Mullen, on stage with me here, has worked with the National Lottery Heritage Fund since 2006 and is currently undertaking a PhD research on the role of heritage in a divided society. His particular interest is the development of ethical approaches to contentious commemoration. He chairs the decade of Centenaries Roundtable, which includes universities, museums, various public bodies, as well as community groups. He's a member of the Irish government's expert advisory committee on the national inventory of intangible cultural heritage and is on the board of the Arts Council of Northern Ireland. Paul, you're very welcome. Liam Campbell lives in the Sperrin Mountains in County Tyrone and is originally from Inishowen in County Donegal. He is the built and cultural heritage officer with Lockney Landscape Partnership, having previously worked as a television producer before returning to academia. Liam has published and lectured widely on heritage and environmental issues, especially about the northwest of Ireland. He completed his PhD at Ulster University in 2011 on the cultural heritage of rivers. He's a visiting lecturer at East Tennessee State University and also the author of the book that in some ways has instigated this particular gathering tonight. It's called Room for the River and we'll be hearing more about it shortly. Liam, you're very welcome. So that's who we are and where we are currently, as it were. And each of us has had many experiences and made many decisions along the way that have made us the people that we are. But the circumstances of our birth were something in which we had no say. So in view of the fact that we're going to be discussing aspects of heritage, home, and hopefully healing, I thought it would be useful to ask our panel to introduce themselves in terms of who they started out being. In other words, as you will often be asked impolitely in this nosy country, who are ye, who are your people, and where are you come? And in answering that, would you also consider to what extent your own ancestry, your own family heritage, so to speak, and where you spent your childhood have continued to define your identity and your sense of yourself? Also, do you feel at home where you live? in this country. And if you'd all do that briefly, that would be a great achievement. Right. Uh, I might add in my own Tuppence Worth at the end of this, but Liam, would you mind starting us off, please, answering those few questions about your own genealogy? It's one of the hardest things as I get older when people say, where are you from? And as you rightly said at the start, I, uh, I live in the Spurn Mountains now, but I come from Manishowen. And I was thinking about this, and as the theme is water, 
I would say I come from between the two waters, between the foil and the swilly in any shown. And as they say in Irish, Idr and Da Ishka. And so I can think of the house that I lived in as a child. My sister still lives there. But I, I, I always place that house in the wider landscape. You know, it, it's the place where I, where I played and grew and the, the, the wider area, the, the, as they call it sometimes in, in, in architectural things, the curtilage of my house. So it's not just the house, you know, it's the fields and the other places. And it's, it's between those two waters, between the swilly and the foil. And, you know, that's why, in, in a way, it has been a, a huge part of my psyche, I suppose, uh, just being that closeness to water, even though I live in the mountains now. So where am I from? Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of between two places. Okay, give us a brief word about your ancestry in terms of, you were talking about earlier on tonight about your grandparents and yeah, so on, okay. very briefly. So in my, uh, I, 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 my, my maternal grandfather was a lighthouse keeper from Fanad and Donegal and, you know, served during the First World War, I suppose pre-partition uh, in Easter Hall and was back there uh, post-partition in the Second World War. So that, 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 that's from my maternal side. Uh, my uh, father's side are Campbells, and people automatically think, you know, William is my, is, is my other name, well, Liam, think, oh, well, William Campbell sounds very Scottish, and I have no Scottish blood mm -hmm. in me as far as I know. We're actually Macaquil, a sept of the O'Neills. Okay, so, right. there you are. Okay, so you're happy about that, in other words? Well, <laughs> confused maybe a bit. <laughs> okay, well, thank you for that, Liam. Uh, Bernadette, would you mind following up on that, uh, a bit of your own life story, the earlier part? I think we're hearing Bernadette. I'm just muted. Yeah, can you hear me now? That's better, yeah, Bernadette, yeah, yeah sorry. sorry. Uh, I was mesmerized by Liam there and had switched <laughs> off my sound. Uh, my father was John Devlin, and he died when I was nine. But he had a significant impact on my life. There were five girls, and, and one boy was the last child in the house, and he was called John. And my father taught us... Uh, who we were and and he taught us that you know your father was john devlin and your grandfather was john devlin and your great-grandfather was john mckeever and your great-great-grandfather was john lochern and it was only actually as i grew up i realized i'd always assumed that that was my father's father's grandfather and great-grandfather just in that rhyme but in fact, my father had listed all the men that our maternal line had married and from whom they had produced the next generation. Right. So, uh, so, so that's how it was. But my, my great great grandfather, John Lochern, lived on the top of the Sperrins, and John McKeever lived on the top of the Sperrins. John Devlin, my grandfather, lived on the shores of Loch Ney, and John Devlin, my father, was born uh, way down near Lismaskey in Fermanagh. And somewhere within the mix of this, there are mill workers from Belfast who came up to the factories in Cookstown. Uh, there are horse dealers. There are soldiers in the British Army. Uh, there are itinerant Hawkers of Delph, we're often called the Delphies. Right. Uh, but I've always known who I was. That's who I am. I'm, I'm, I'm a mixture of plain people. Uh, nobody wealthy in the family, and I was born in rooms, two rooms over the milk bar, uh, in the in the late forties when when people didn't have easy access to houses and families often lived in old large houses that landlords had set out in rooms and my parents had two rooms one in which the family lived and the other in which the family slept and then we got a house when the fourth child was added to the family and so that fundamentally shapes who I am is the 
the class of people I come from. I come from neighboring rural farming people and my great my granny at the age of 17 was betrothed to a man 20 years older than her and she always told us the story of her father and her future husband spitting on their hands and shaking them to seal the bargain <laughs> because the her father, who lived on the top of the Sparrows and was a horse dealer, was marrying her to this man who appeared to be wealthy because he had a pub, <laughs> but he had stables at the back of it on the main street in Cookstown, and his yard run down to the railway station, <clears throat> and so her father could take the horses to the mine fair fresher and quicker than his competitors. Brilliant. You'll, I think you'll have to do that, that. That's who I am. Right. I, 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 a I, I, and a traveller and a tinker and, <laughs> and whatever else you like. I think, there's a, I think there's a novel or two on there, uh, <laughs> definitely. Linda, Linda, if you don't mind yourself, please, next. Hi. I, I was born in the 60s and um, my family lived in the street, Thistle Street, in East Belfast, at the bottom of Newton Arch Road. Um, it was the same street. My father was born on that street. My grandmother was born on that street. Um, at the time, my father was a sheet metal worker and my mother had been a mill worker in, over in the Crumlin Road in New York's mill. Um, my, nanny's, my nanny on my daddy's side, she was a Church of Ireland woman. Her mother had come from Sainfield and had, had settled in East Belfast. But my grandfather was from Essex in England and he had come over in the 1930s and they had got married. On the other side of my family, my mother's side from North Belfast, my grandmother was a Catholic woman from Clifton Street and my grandfather was a Presbyterian from Lagan Isle and my mother was born and reared up in Lagan Isle. So I think both, when I look at my, I suppose, who I am, I'm like a lot of people in Northern Ireland, I'm a mix of a lot of things. And recently my husband's nephew paid for him and I to get DNA tests done and I come out, I think, as 60 odd percent Scottish and I think it was 30 something, 30 something um, Irish and a, and a little bit of English. So, you know, I'm, I'm a bit of a dolly mixture. But I'm <laughs> yeah. And I think one of the things that always strikes me because nobody ever sat me down as a child and told me I was this or told me I was that. But my, my father's family, who always had a great impact on me because I, I lived a lot with my grandparents, they were both members of the Communist Party of Ireland. But my nanny used to tell the story of about the only time she went over to visit my grandfather's people over in London. And um, as I say, his people were, um, they, they, they couldn't read or write. They came from a very poor background. But she said when she was in the house, she, she got up and looked out the window. And my grandfather's mother said, you're come away here, come away from the window or that horrible Irish woman down the street will see you. And my <laughs> nanny took real offence at that, how dare they? And she left. So I always knew as a child I was Irish and because my granddad was English when him and her used to argue it was always that bloody English man and he was wrong because he was English and we were right because we were Irish. So I was really <laughs> shocked when later on somebody tried to tell me I wasn't Irish. Yeah, yeah. Of course I was. Oh, well listen that's, that's, that's marvellous. We'll revisit all of that. <coughs> that's a very rich mix of influences there altogether. Uh, Paul, you're the remain. Well, I'm, I'll come after you, but uh, if you don't mind, <laughs> now give us give us your side of the story, please. Okay, Joe. Well, I currently live in Edenderry in South Belfast, which is a fantastic place to live. It's in Lagan Valley Regional Park, close to the Giant's Ring, and I suppose uh, that gives a kind of a, um, a sort of a link into something that's always been important to me, and that is the historic world around around me, particularly archaeology, and. Um, uh, I was born in North Belfast. Um, my dad died when I was one year old, so I never got to know him. But my mother did a wonderful thing, and that was um, send me down to Ocher, between Ocher and Clocher, where he was from, and I would stay uh, as a child uh, uh, in one, on one of the neighboring farms, um, right beside where the family farm had been. And that was a wonderful experience uh, um, for me because it gave me that sense of, I suppose, the Tyrone background. And uh, from a genealogical perspective, um, we can go back to the 
late 18th century, can't really probe much, much further. Um, to two brothers, um, 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 one uh, uh, sort of uh, a brother who went on to have a family that got involved in newspapers in Tyrone, and uh, there was another on my own kind of family side, as I found out at a later point in time, there was a connection that ended up uh, the fam a family here who set up the dairy, or are involved with the Derry Journal. Right. And um, so, uh, quite rich. My grandfather, um, uh, from Tyrone, um, was in the 1920s a judge in the Sinn Féin courts. Whereas on my mother's side, my grandfather was uh, 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 an absolute vehement uh, uh, constitutional nationalist and sort of drilled in that sense of, of, of living within the context that we, we kind of lived in then. So uh, a, a, a rich background, yeah. uh, which you know, connects me sort of to kind of a, a past that I've always been intrigued in learning more about. Were you kind of predestined at birth, almost to some extent? Were you Probably. Know, yeah. My grandfather was a a, 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 a librarian. Yeah. And um, uh, one interesting aspect there was uh, uh, the Central Library um, did a project of the librarians from the First World War, and they found all these letters that librarians had sent back to the. Uh, chief librarian, and I think this was to ensure that their jobs were kept open when they came back from war. And uh, my grandfather's letters were found, and uh, they're wonderfully po poetic, and he describes what it is like to be at the front. And um, he was there to, in France until 1919, and then he came back and uh, uh, ended up as the chief librarian in uh, the Falls Road Library. Um, where, amongst others, he gave books out to people like Brian Moore and uh, um, brought many sort of writers and artists in to talk to the people mm. of the Falls about literature, art, mm. and whatever. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for that. I'll be coming back to you first with the first question. I suppose I should add, add in my, my brief biography as well. Um, uh, I used to describe myself as a typical dairyman. But actually, when I've examined my credentials properly, I would say I'm quintessentially dairyman, the dairyman, because it was actually one of the very few people who was born inside Derry's walls, you know, and that, that's, that wasn't a, a, a very frequent occurrence at all because there were very few habitable places inside the Derry walls. 1951, um, I lived inside uh, Derry's walls in a tenement, just directly looking out onto the walls. My, I was the firstborn of seven. Uh, my parents had a one-room attic flat in this tenement house. Uh, my, my parents were from, from Derry. My father was a plasterer from Deanery Street in, part, in Brandywell, part of the Bogside. And my mother was a shirt factory worker uh, who came from Bishop Street Without. Now, I have to explain what Bishop Street Without actually means because uh, if you lived inside the, the walled area on Bishop Street, then you lived in a very fancy building indeed. That's where the courthouse was, where the deanery was, where hotels were, uh, you know, very fine architecture. And just, just at the, at the, when you came to Bishop's Gate, which was the, the end of the walls, <coughs> that was Bishop Street without a long <coughs> straggly street that went way, way down to the south end towards the River Foyle. And that's where my mother, she said, she, li she came from Bishop Street without. She said it meant without running uh, <laughs> hot water, <laughs> without an indoor <laughs> toilet, and without many other things. But uh, so they, they were, um, I only lived there for two years, so I have no memory of it except what my mother has told me about it. And we moved up to Craigan, where we moved. We had an upwardly mobile move three times when we were still in Craigan <laughs> after that. <laughs> so that's, that's more or less where I grew up. Um, I have, I've, my, my grandparents on my mother's side, or, or my father's side rather, were dairy people as far back as I can take it, back to the late 1700s. I don't know how they got there, with a name like Mahan. And on my mother's side, they came from a mixture of Donegal from the Glenties and from uh, beyond Bunkrana down to the Illies. Uh, but I have one, there was one significant, uh, I suppose, factor in my upbringing and in my heritage that has, has must have influenced me. My name, the full name is Joseph Eamon Mahan. I was born on the 30th of June, 1951, and on the 1st of July, 1951, Eamon de Valera paid a visit to, to Derry, and he was met, by, amongst other people, a delegation which included my grandfather. My grandfather's name was Joe Mahan, like mine. 
So I was christened unavoidably Joseph Eamon Mahan. So I am the living commemoration of a small <laughs> local historical event of some significance <laughs> in my town, and Brilliant. I carry that Brilliant. with me. I don't know how it's affected my outlook on life, to be perfectly honest. It hasn't really kept me back so far, <laughs> anyway. Uh, but anyway, we all have influences that we bring with us, baggage we brought mm. into this world, mm. not mm. of our choosing, but how we deal with it, of course, is up mm. to us then after that. So listen, that's our own personal heritage, and I think it's very, very interesting and fascinating that we are such a mixture of people within such a small place with different family experiences. Paul, we are going to talk about heritage in a more general sense, and your job, I think, I used to think you had a cosy job, but when you examine it, it's not anything but. Heritage in a divided society can be a very contentious thing, uh, especially when it comes to commemoration, as we talked about. So could you give us any kind of useful definition, maybe or a few definitions of what we actually mean uh, by heritage, in the sense that one person's heritage could be another person's history of exploitation. All you have to do is look across the water of the turmoil that universities are in over their associations with slavery, for example. Uh, so um, is there good heritage? Is there bad heritage? Uh, heritage which should be shared and heritage which perhaps will never be shared. What are your thoughts on that? Well, heritage is what we want to remember from the past in the present and pass on uh, to the, for the future, I suppose, to future generations. Um, so, you know, it is m many things and everything um, that sort of links us to the past. Uh, and it's many, many forms, you know, from the such a beautiful building like we're in now to which is sort of tangible heritage. Um, it's our books, it's our statues, it's uh, uh, also the intangible element, those the customs and the things that we do. Heritage is all about people. And uh, it's, if you ask the question, is there good or bad heritage? I don't think we can, we can, we can even uh, uh, say that some heritage is good or bad because we live in a very sort of plural world and you've got people with so many different perspectives. So to start to take judgment on other people's heritage, I think, is uh, a, a dangerous thing that we should do, that we, we, we could do. So we need to create a much more sort of plural space. And I think that's far more interesting because it allows us to investigate. It's, you know, I mean, I was brought up, we talked about where we were from. I was brought, brought up in a very strong nationalist uh, uh, sort of way of thinking. But I then began learning about 1798 and the United Irishmen, who were mainly Presbyterian, and uh, the wonderful stories about that. And you look, you look at so many different uh, aspects of the past, and there are so many varied and interesting stories that start to emerge. So, for example, the Ulster Museum, one of the first objects, if you go into the history gallery there, is uh, the Dungiven costume. That particular costume, um, uh, shows textile techniques which come from both Scotland, uh, England, and Ireland. And what that says in the 17th century was that all of those influences were sort of uh, interconnected uh, uh, and, and there. And one of the big problems, I think, that we, 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 we in Northern Ireland, we, we continue to do is we push this binary notion of us and them um, when in fact, you know, we live, the world is plural. Now, Liam's book is all about the landscape, the foil, and uh, 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 through nature, we see the wondrous di diversity that just is, and we've got to find that diversity in ourselves, those plural notions, that plurality, which helps us to, to, to uh, 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 understand, I suppose, the beauty of life, but also the complexity of life and heritage should be comp the past should be complex. Right. Once we try to make it simple, mm. we're trying to use it for purposes that generally aren't. Okay, the best. even our even our brief kind kind of round of, of our own background shows you how complex that can be. Mm. Bernadette, when I come to you next, uh, um, some years ago, Liam and myself, when Liam and I were working on, on TV together, we did a series of programs about uh, migrant workers and about migration generally into this part of the world. Um, and the, um, the program series was called Homelands to Townlands. And as part of that uh, series, uh, we, you were very kind to give us an interview um, about the work that you were doing with STEP <coughs> at the time. And uh, I remember 
recall, well, it was a memorable phrase or a sentence that you used to describe the government attitude uh, <laughs> towards migrant workers, and you said, if they could find ways of extracting the labor from their bodies without actually having to have them physically here in this country, then they'd be much happier about that. I wanted to ask you about that, your continuing work with STEP, and also where our notions of heritage, of Irish cultural heritage or intangible heritage, um, is that an obstacle to, to the integration of people into this country, if you understand what I'm trying to get at? They're coming here with their own backgrounds, their own, uh, their own sense of heritage of who they are. Does integration mean that they have to divest themselves of that and assume some of ours, or what? You've turned off your sound again, I think. Picking up on, on Paul's point about if you, you know, the complexity of things and if you try to make them simple, uh, I think the first thing we always have to explain to, to, to people at home, as it were, about people who arrive here to join us, however they come, but usually they have come to Northern Ireland because we sent for them because of skilled labour shortages, and then families come. But we tend to look at it as just because they all got off the same bus. You know, we're very, we can be quite small-minded because they all turned up here at the same time, off the same bus, off the same boat, off the same aeroplane. We have a very simplistic assumption that they all started in the same place. You know, just because they all ended up in Dungannon, we think they all came from the same town, wherever that was. Yeah. And so that all those people have a common perspective on life, <coughs> a common history, a common culture that is them and, and we are us. <clears throat> and it's interesting as well that when it comes to immigration, we can see ourselves that we're looking inwardly as being separate uh, in that binary notion of them and us at home. We become one unified people, which is the people who should be here. And the, the immigrant population becomes the people who shouldn't be here. And the second thing that we notice is that even then when you have what I call benign racism. You have the people who want who want to be welcoming and who want people to feel happy here. And one of the great ways of doing that is, of course, through culture. But they imagine that everybody coming in to the country who's actually come to work and their living conditions aren't good and the things that are on their mind are getting a decent day's pay, having enough money to send home, getting a home and a house started so that family can join them. And what we want them to do is sing and dance for us. <laughs> so we invite them. Yeah. We invite them to, you know, uh, to play their music, to sing and dance for us. And I'm always saying then to people, you know, did your Harry, did your Mary, did your Mildred, uh, head to America, did they take their dancing shoes with them? Yeah. Or yeah. did they take the toolbox <clears throat> with them? But that said, when you work in a different way and let everybody be themselves, it's surprising how much commonality there is. We celebrate in August every year in Dungannon uh, the Community Family Festival and in our community <coughs> building we just open up and everybody, first of all everybody brings food and then we discovered that poor people the world over, although we're not allowed to call them poor anymore, people with lived experience of poverty, that's the most of us, <laughs> but people who have to work hard for a living across the whole world each due. One way or another it's due. Yeah. Some people with potatoes and make Irish stew and some people with beans and yeah. some people put parsley in it and some people <clears throat> put chilli in it. But the culture around food, if you then invite people to eat with you and to join you in 
celebrating friendship and everybody has room to do that in their own way. Uh, people will borrow your fiddle because they didn't take their fiddle from East Timor. Yeah. And they'll yeah. play it. But, you know, they won't play Irish music. They'll play the music they know. The children will dance and everybody will dance in their own way. So we have a great, in, we have a great intercultural festival that ends up with a Kaylee. And it's the same thing when people celebrate dance together. Everybody has a form of group dancing. And no matter where in the world it comes from, it, it, it embodies dancing around the circle, moving in and moving out, lots of swinging and jumping up and down. But the commonality in our cultures, although they are ma differently manifested, is fantastic and it's a great starting point for beginning to look at other interests and then again around language uh, it's just you know I'm a great believer and nobody should ever lose the language they have they should add to it and to be able to support people to learn English without losing their Polish, their Tatum, their Lithuanian uh, is brilliant. And then we see uh, how, la how language works and how bilingualism works when you're not afraid, when, when, you're, when you're not afraid of words you don't understand. Yeah. If people would say to us, make them talk English because they might be talking about us, our suspicious minds. <laughs> might, yeah. We don't know. They might be saying bad things about us, and we won't yeah. know. Uh, and yeah. you say, "Well, you're saying bad things about them," and thankfully, they don't. They don't hear. Yeah. Yeah. But you get over those fears, and, yeah. and I think that when we look at culture that way, uh, it's a, it's a it's a very very powerful way of beginning to bring people together equitably. Right. Okay, Bernard, thank you. That, that's a great cue for Linda, actually, when you're talking about the importance of language and of keeping your own language when you're acquiring a new language. Linda, uh, <coughs> you're on record as saying the Irish language for you was something to be reclaimed as part of your heritage. Uh, that's how you felt about it. Can you explain how how that, that, that sensation, that feeling came about, that conviction came about? Yeah. Well, I suppose for me growing up, I, I didn't even know the Irish language existed. Didn't know it was there. Didn't know anybody spoke Irish. And it was only later on as an adult, I became aware of this, this kind of shadowy thing that I, I have never engaged with. But when I was introduced to it, I was intrigued by it. And as I always say, you know, it was sitting in a, in a taster session and being told that the way you say you have Irish is to say to Gaelic Uggam. And I remember thinking, you know, I would like to be able to say to Gaelic Uggam, I would like to say that I have Irish, that it's part of my identity. And that's why I started learning a few words. But even when I started to do that, and I, even though I don't come from a, a, a you know, particularly unionist background, it's unionism on my mother's side. And I've never signed up to that sort of sectarianism. But even within me, there was a, a feeling, you know, am I doing something wrong? Am I, am I betraying something, you know, about my own community? Because I regarded the Irish language as people <coughs> to the other community, let's put it that way. And that was something that I had to, to realise that I was very wrong. And I started to, to read around the subject and I started to to learn that it was in our place names and in our surnames, that it was in, you know, words that we use in our everyday speech, that when I looked around me all of a sudden, you know, I thought, oh, that's Irish, you know, that's the Irish language. And it was such a, such an awakening. I felt, my goodness, I've been living my whole life with a, a paper bag over my head. Why did I not see this? Why did I not realise that was there? And I suppose I started to realise, well, I didn't because I was never allowed to. I was never given that opportunity. Um, you know, my own community stopped me from doing that. And later on, when I, I started to learn Irish, and because my husband was the leader of the Progressive Unionist Party at the time, 
it sort of caused a, a, a bit of a sort of interest in the media. And people immediately attacked me that I was doing something terribly wrong, that I was I was leading, I think that the, the comment was that I was leading these people um, down the green brick road into the Irish Bowl. I was just being horrified at this. I, I, you know, why would anybody say that? And, um, you know, my time my husband said to me, you know, tough enough, don't take it personally. And I thought, well, it is personal, they're talking about me, you know. But um, I realised then yeah, he, he was right. And for me, the language then, well, here, here's an example. I remember a BBC journalist coming into my offices and interviewing some of my students. And he leaned over to one of the students and he said, you know, this is wonderful. This is an English man. And he said, this is wonderful what you are doing here. You know, that you are, you are engaging with this other culture. And I had to interrupt him and say, no, excuse me, I'm sorry, we're not engaging with another culture. This is our culture too. This belongs to us as well. And, you know, for me, the realisation of the language had gone to Scotland, it had gone to the Isle of Man, it was part of the family of Celtic languages spoken throughout these islands. You know, there are Celtic names in England, there are there's a Celtic language in Wales, there's a Celtic language in Cornwall, there's a, a Gaelic language in Scotland and the Isle of Man and here. For me, these are linguistic links. So it gave me a feeling of belonging. And also, I suppose another thing that was really, really important to me is I'm a Presbyterian. I, my family, I, I come from a background of agnostics, so an atheist, so we never had any connection with the church. But it was only by going over into the national community. I, I did a 1798 tour, and as I said, my great grandparents were from St. Fee's. I had that background, but it was Catholic people were telling me about my own history. And again, that's for me a really sad thing in Northern Ireland, that we are denied that knowledge of something that unites us and brings us together. But that's not what we're being taught in schools. That's not what we're being taught in the community. What we're being taught is division and bitterness and, you know, all, all the issues, not, not to share. Well, uh, that, that's an extraordinary um, story in the sense that you come from a background where probably you grew up um, where the natural kind of outcome of your upbringing would have been to, to be um, hostile to the Irish language. I suppose that, that once you discovered the, the people, for example, who were responsible for the Celtic revival, the Irish language revival in the glens of Antrim at the turn of the century, were mostly Presbyterian people as well. I'm sure you've studied the, the achievements of those people and took encouragement and took heart from them as well. Absolutely. And, you know, the more I am heard and the more I've read, the more I have been able to take ownership of the language, I suppose, and the more I've been able to say to other people that, you know, and, and again, what for me was very important when I started Hers, which is the, the Irish Language Centre that I run, you know, we didn't want to do, you know, we're taking it back, you know, it wasn't, we wanted to become part of the Irish language community. And we've done that very successfully. And we've done it because we have had a willingness to do it, but also because there's been a willingness within the Irish language community to welcome us in and respect who we are. So, you know, I, I've just found a community of people who are not wanting to keep something to themselves. They want to share it. And they want to share it with anybody, whether you're an immigrant or you're a Protestant or, you know, whoever you are, they are just over the moon that somebody else wants to speak the language. And that's how I see the case. I have loads of questions I'd love to ask you, Linda, but we have to move along because we've actually limited time. And I'm just realising that we haven't even really talked about the, the instigator, as I said, of this, which is Liam's book. Um, Liam, uh, Room for the River, uh, subtitled The Foil Catchment Landscape, Connecting People, Place and Nature. Uh, I'm going to give a short quote from it, if you don't mind. Most of us have forgotten the skills of systematic attentiveness that open us to the instruction of the natural world. This region requires us to become more intimate inhabitants and to regrow our sense of community as a part of that inhabitation. So your book, I've read most of it. It's very much about exploring uh, an intense kind of relationship with the local right? But uh, I think you're also arguing that you cannot really do that without connecting to the global as well. Is that fair? Is that accurate? Yes, uh, 
I think so, Joe. Uh, I mean, Paul mentioned connectedness and, and indeed all, uh, everybody, Linda and, and, and Bernadette have as well. And, uh, you know, a theme of this conference is healing. <coughs> and you're talking about connecting to the global. I, I think it was Edward Said said, survival is about making connections between things. And I, and I think here's a concrete example that relates to Irish language. Uh, in that, um, and the loss, I mean, in many ways, the book's about healing and about making connections and our disconnect from nature. Yeah. One of the things that I discovered in my research, I was in Nakrua Hagorma, the blue stacks in Donegal, and it's probably the furthest place you can get from Derry, where the source of the, of the foil, one of the sources of the foil system, there are many sources in Derry, Donegal, and Tyrone. But one of the things I, I discovered there was the loss of the language to do with different types of water lands and the landscape. So we kind of use just water as a generic term, but you know, there, 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 you know there's different types of sta standing water, there's eddies, there, there's different types of bog water. And, 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 and I so discovered that the loss of the brilliant words, something like 72 words to do with different types of water. You know, we just use water glibly, clean yeah, water or dirty yeah, water. Yeah. 72 different types of water in the landscape the loss of that language and those words is almost uh, parallel with the loss of people's disconnect from being out in the landscape and, out, and knowing nat and being close to nature. It's a loss of understanding uh, as well. Absolutely. Words, so yeah. there's a loss of the understanding of the language, which is, runs parallel with, with people's disconnect from the place. So I, I think, you know, uh, you know I, I, it was my Taurus, it was my pilgrimage to try and see where the roots of that disconnect, you know, from nature were. And I did it through the river. I mean, it could have been done through trees. But for me, water was, water was something that was very deep. And I mean, you talked about genealogy earlier, uh, and I only realize this now that he's gone, but my father was a water diviner. You know, oh, I, I, yeah, actually. Yeah, yeah. And he, and he was in, he, you know, he was in demand, you know, looking for, looking for whales. And... I was talking to somebody around Loch Ney about it lately down in Arbo. And, you know, for me, that was something, that was partly the beginning of my journey, you know, back to my childhood and realizing the importance of something as simple as water and how maybe I personally needed to spend a wee bit more time in the place. And that is the exact same thing. I mean, Ber you know, Bernadette talked about people from East Timor. Um, a friend of mine lately was talking about another great river, the Clyde. And a lot of people from Somalia are living in Glasgow, ha have moved to Glasgow. And Somalia, as you know, is a, you know, a, 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 a war ravaged a, a, and a country with so much poverty. And when a lot of, particularly the men folk came, they thought about, you know, we use these words, integra integration and all. And two things happened. The Gal Gale Trust, I don't know if Linda knows of it, in Glasgow, a fabulous organization. Th they had a project to build boats and suddenly, these Somalian men got involved in it because it's a coastal country. And boat building, you know, we're talking about making connections, making stew, it's the same thing. The second one was Somalians are fascinated by soccer. And of course, what other city can you go to? Glasgow, you know, with yeah. soccer. Now, yeah. we'll not get into the, the, the Celtic and Rangers, but, you know, so for me, in many ways, the book is about reconnecting and making connections, and I think everybody has alluded to that tonight. Well, um, believe it or not, I mean, I, I, I have a feeling our conversation is only just beginning, but in fact, we've, we're, we're nearly at the end of our time, sad, very, very sadly. Uh, and conclusion, I just want to remind people that Liam's book is published by Murdoch Books. It's entitled Room for the River, the Foil Catchment Landscape, Connecting People, Place and Nature. I hope we've done a bit of connecting of that nature ourselves tonight. I've thoroughly enjoyed uh, re get, making reacquaintanceship with, with Bernadette. I'm meeting Linda the first time. Paul, of course, and I and you are old friends. Uh, so I just hope that our, our discourse tonight has, uh, has engaged other people. Uh, I think we're going to sit on here for a bit longer and, uh, and talk about some of the issues that we raised tonight. So my thanks to Bernadette Michalski, to Linda Irvine, to Paul Mullen, uh, to Liam Campbell, of course, and to our audience, wherever you are in the world, thank you for joining us and good night.